I remember years ago at Esalen, you know, you had said that you were determined to change the map of the whole physiology and how we saw it. So, how, how, and, and you know, I've been very struck with your karma and your destiny, really. So, how did that begin to happen? The, you know, from, was it from the occupational therapy as you began? I mean, how did that happen? You didn't drop in the sky. So, in other words, when I you... was in fourth grade, I used to be a fighter before I broke my arm. And you mean even just physical fire. fighter? Oh, really? Again, I grew up in a rough world. Right. And um, a boy and I got into a fist fight at school. And the teacher sent him home but kept me after school because I was the girl mm -hmm. who wasn't supposed to fight. Mm. And my father was leaving that day for the circus. I wouldn't see him maybe for six months. Mm. So I began weeping hysterically. And she finally said, if you will stop crying, I will let you go. And I turned to her and I said, I wouldn't give you the pleasure. And I yelled even louder. <laughs> so I went screaming out of the class. You wouldn't class. give her the pleasure of stopping crying? Right. Wow. And then I thought I wouldn't see my dad, but I was not going to give her that power. Wow. And he waited for me, of course, but I didn't know that. Wow. Okay. So, so I... Wow. And I remember even you younger, could have played Medea, you know. I mean, if you, being in a fight with six boys around me, and I took on every one of them until I fell and hurt my hand, and my grandmother was coming home, and they all ran away. I was very much a fighter. Great. Well, I mean, it's obvious, you know. But I'm. But then, a when level. I broke my arm and I couldn't use it for two years, you see, that was a change of karma. Right. I literally yeah. couldn't use it. Yeah. I had to use my left hand for everything for two years. Okay, so, so that 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 didn't go away. The feistiness. Well, my mother was. I mean, I grew up. I can't. Your mother was. I a grew fighter. up. She was a fighter. She was defiant. She wouldn't let the polio thing, you know. And she also had a scar where somebody else tried to kill her once. I mean, this was not a. This was a. This was. This just. I, you know, people say it's not good to grow up with violence, and I agree it's not, and I've done my best. But we're not, like people say, oh, this is, I, how do I say this in such a way that it's not misinterpreted? I do my best with helping for poverty and violence loss, but it's not a black mark. It doesn't... Um, Whatever is our problem defined by society, we're not limited by it. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's take care of it so that people don't have to suffer. Mm -hmm. But don't label people as being less because of illness, because of disability, because of finances, because of all of these things that we, we, we put people in a box because of disadvantage. That's the word I'm looking for. We're not limited by being disadvantaged. Yes, mm -hmm. let's help people not be disadvantaged. Let's help people be fully healthy and, because they can't do it by themselves. You can't come out of that by yourself without somebody offering a hand. Right. And, and society doesn't have, the world doesn't have to be in this situation. The, the life has enough challenges without adding to them. But take away the the disadvantaged label that pushes somebody down. Yes. Yeah. We, can, we can meet the challenges of life and we can help others not mm -hmm. to be so uh, repressed. Mm -hmm. so anyway, I'm not sure how to say it in such a way, but it's the labeling of mm -hmm. that this person has is better prepared than this person. Mm -hmm. Yes, in a way that's true, but in a way it's not. I mean, one of the things our kids worked when they were in school, college, and Issa went to a very wealthy school. That's your? The younger, my younger your son. Youngest son. And he once said that he visited somebody, one of his classmates, who's, I don't want to say it in such a way they would recognize, but they were very, they were wealthy people, and the father had been a self 
made person or whatever. And he said, I could see him looking at me and wondering why his son wasn't, mm. didn't carry that same determination that he had because mm -hmm. his son was kind of, he'd been given everything. Yeah, sure. So he didn't, he wasn't necessarily advantaged for someone who was more disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. But that also didn't have to be a disadvantage that he was so well. I'll go around in circles. No, I hear you. But okay, so, but the vision, the dawning vision of the, the sensibility of how you began to envision the, the, uh, the whole anatomical physiology depth that you were determined to do, how did that happen? In other words, how did that idea start? Was it, I mean, here, okay, so you're, you're, you're silently rebel, rebellious. You're, you have this, um, these imprints that are very, uh, that are tremendously varied, and certainly opportunities that most people don't have. And the incongruity of your, of your upbringing, uh, the, religi the, the religious variations, the parents breaking up, your mother being very determined, and just as kind of, uh, would you describe yourself as an outsider, kind of? I mean, you know, the way we think of things? I mean, it seems that way because you didn't have a conventional life. So you seem kind of like an outsider to me, which, which has a little bit of the description thing that you we're talking about people being disadvantaged, that you had a kind of... Yeah, people would have considered me, even I was disadvantaged by the school I went to. Oh, really? Well, it was considered on the other side, literally on the other side, it was on the other side of the tracks. But because it was a disadvantaged school, and it was a new school, here's another piece of the anatomy, is they, they got funding to do a special, what they called science research class. And the man who designed it was wonderful. He was one of the people who reached a hand down for me mm. or up for me. And uh, he chose 12 students to do specialized science research projects. So someone did a Dysophilus fly heredity thing or something. It's the only one I remember. And I chose to, to do a dissection of a cat mm. and to learn all the muscles mm. and to compare them with human. Mm. So I couldn't make the first cut, but after that, uh, so that was my year's project. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was already interested. And then when I went to the university, I had a year of, anat of human and uh, comparative anatomy mm -hmm. with also wonderful teachers. I'm going to leave the anatomy part for a moment because then I would like to go to the place that I, that, uh, I worked because they took me in as the last, for my last internship. Yeah. And I decided after being there a year that I had to get back into dance. Mm -hmm. That's another kind of side story. How but old I, were you at that point? 22. Mm -hmm. And um, I signed up. It turned out that the dance major program was from 4 to 6 every day. Mm -hmm. And I worked to 5, but they let me go at 4, quarter to 4, because I could just walk to the place. And then I would go in on some Saturday. They were wonderful. Mm -hmm. I would go in on some Saturdays or whatever to make up time, but I never even had to tell them. It's just they knew and I knew that I would make up time. Mm. So I joined the dance majors, and then a year later, at the end of that year, I decided I wanted to go to India because I had gone to a lecture of a man who had been an associate of Tagore Rabindranath Tagore, and he had come to the university, and he was give, he was speaking poetry in Bengali, and I was weeping. I didn't know a word he was saying, but I was weeping. Mm. So the, Tagore had started an institute called Shantanagitan, which is the place of peace, and they were teaching all kinds of things that he the weaving and all the spinning, all the things that he would advocated for home industry. So I was going to go there. How were you I, going to afford to go there? Well, I had been working a year. So you had some money saved up that you could I had have? a lot of money saved up. 
And would that be okay in terms of career management? Well, the other thing I was going to, I had a um, job opportunity in Lebanon working with Palestinian refugee children as an OT. I was going to go around the world. and I see. So that was already determined. Yes. And one of the things that had happened, though, oh no, so I did that, was that in the spring, um, three teachers separately in the dance department said, there's something about you that reminds me of Eric Hawkins, whom I had never heard of. But being, coming from a very superstitious, my mother was highly superstitious. In the show business, there was all these things. Um, I thought, well, I have to pay attention to this. So I called Eric Hawkins' studio, and it turned out he had just moved to 78 Fifth Avenue, which was a highlight of his career. Isn't that Greenwich Village? Yeah, well, it's just south of 14th Street. Yeah. Yeah, and Fifth Avenue. And he was running a three-week summer June program. And so I canceled my trip to India and to Lebanon, and I went to study with Eric. Mm -hmm. And he was the teacher I was going around the world to find. Wow. And then when I, so I stayed this summer and I came back to Ohio because meanwhile they had sent me to California for three months to study in near LA and Downey, California at the Rancho Los Amigos mm -hmm. Hospital, which was one of the leading centers. And still is. And this is where they also had a lot of children who'd had polio who couldn't live alone mm -hmm. with their parents. And Betty Yerksa was my supervisor, and fantastic influence on my life. And one of the things that I learned there, among other things, was how in polio, the specificity with which muscles work and how they compensate when they don't work. Mm. And I also was in, greatly inspired by the children. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go back to Ohio to be sure I had transmitted what I had learned in those three months the previous year. And meanwhile, there were two women there, young women, around 20, who had brain injury. One was had gotten the uh, smallpox vaccination on her, by her uncle. She was going to go to Europe and you had to have smallpox and created a quite severe brain dysfunction. And the other was a woman who'd had brain dysfunction from birth. And I asked the doctors there who were fantastic. Dr. Burke, who was in a wheelchair, he had gotten polio as a medical student. And Dr. Ernest E. Johnson, who may have been one of the original quiz kids or something, brilliant mm. men, terribly compassionate and brilliant. I asked if I could explore with these two women what I had learned at Eric's. So in one month, with Eric Hawkins, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by this effortless movement, one mm -hmm. girl could walk when she couldn't. She walked normally for the first time, having had therapy all her life, and the other one greatly improved. And what was so amazing, they were worse when they came from physical therapy, mm -hmm. and the physical therapist and doctor changed the program in PT. That's what was unusual. Not that it was worse, right. but that they were so open. Yeah, very unusual. And bright, and they mm -hmm. saw the change, and they mm -hmm. trusted. This place trusted me, mm -hmm. where the other place had no room. Mm 